Long, so thanks so much for joining us, man. Um, really, really excited to have you on uh, with, our, with our team today. And, and this is actually being posted on, uh, on Lab Code Agents as well. 75,000 agents uh, are, are, are tuning in here and gonna listen to your amazing story um, of perseverance, true inspiration, and just, uh, you know, you've overcome so many amazing, like unbelievable challenges in your life. Um, and I wanna, I wanna talk about that and then also talk about where you've come, like how you've gotten to where you are today, now owning a brokerage in Minnesota, a very, very successful brokerage. Um, when I felt, we, we've been friends now for a few years and, uh, and we've always talked about business and different ideas and, and always have masterminded together. In fact, we were hanging out last night and uh, I had no idea about your story, man. Your story, I don't wanna like ruin it for anyone. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, tell us about your background and uh, welcome. Yeah, thanks Kevin, can you guys all hear me? Yeah, I think we can. I think everyone can hear you. Okay, so uh, uh, you know, I'm my my name's Long. I'm from Minnesota, and uh, you know, I I believe besides uh, God and religion, I believe choice is all but uh, you know, life is all but a choice theory. Right? Okay? It's uh, if you think you can't, you're right. If you think you can't, you're right. So I discovered this when I was much younger. So my story, I'll share a little bit about it. Is uh, I'm originally from Vietnam, and uh, uh, I kind of went through the Vietnam War. So in the 1975, when the U.S. pulled out of Vietnam, a lot of people who are influential uh, can leave as well they want. So my mom and dad uh, both got their, their scholarship to Florida State University. My dad got his Ph.D., my mom got a master. So they went back to Vietnam. My dad was the youngest uh, vice uh, president of the largest uh, university in Vietnam. So he's considered influential. So when the communists come in, Back in those days, they have this thing called re-education camp. So what they do is they arrest anyone who could be a threat to uh, can think for themselves. So they would arrest doctors, attorneys, professors. That's who my dad was. You know, uh, musicians, people who can just think, right? So uh, I was eight years old. I had two younger brothers. They were four and two. So they came in uh, to our house, arrested my dad. Of course, I'm eight. I don't know what the heck's going on. And uh, and you know, and the next thing I knew it and I wouldn't see him again until I was 32 years old. Wow. So I was eight and my two brothers were four too. So I kind of grew up fast, you know, at the man of the house and whatnot. So during this time, things were pretty bad. You know, my, um, the economy was real bad. So billions of people were escaping and leaving Vietnam. Well, we live in a coastal country. So about a third did by land. They go up north through Thailand and Laos and stuff. But most of the people, two thirds or more, did it by sea. So this is, was the escape plan back in the day. It's like humans smuggling. My mom had to buy me a spot in a boat. So I was 14. So at this time, it was my third try. The first two try, we actually got caught. The success rate back then was about 50% that you would make it wow. or less. So what had happened was um, she would buy me a spot in a boat, and I'd be one of whatever money people. So the first two times, we got caught. The reason she sent me early to was this. During that time in the 80s, uh, the Vietnam was at war with the Chinese. So uh, if you get caught and you're a man, they just send you right to the front line if you're 16 or older. And you just die. You're like an ammunition boy running around for someone shoots you. So that's like your death sentence, right? So I was 14. I started when I was 13. I failed the first two times. I got caught, which was probably good. Uh, and then the third time, we made it. So this, this is what happened the third time. So... Uh, uh, I was 14, and it was a school night, and my mom had sent both of my brother to a, a cousin for a sleepover, which I knew something was up, because I already tried twice, right? So I kind of know the routine, but they never want to tell me when it's happening, because I'm a kid. I might tell my friends or my brothers, and they're going to tell somebody we're all going to be busted. So it's like a secret kept. Mm -hmm. So that night, they sent my two brothers uh, you know, to my cousin for a sleepover, uh, and at the time, we still lived with my... Uh, it's, normal in Vietnam. My dad's the oldest son, so we live with our grandparents. So uh, my grandma, maybe my favorite meal that night, you know, it's a uh, pork barbecue. And she kept telling me, eat a lot, eat a lot. And then um, we went to bed. Both of them would come hang out, chat with me, which is not normal in the Asian culture. You know, we don't show a lot of affection that way. Mm -hmm. So I knew something was up. So uh, I went to bed, and it was probably about 3, 4 o'clock. So I got woken up. And my mom said, it's time to go. And I knew that was game time. 
So they took me to meet this man I've never met before, pretty much a stranger, you know, like the Wrangler, so to speak. So uh, they handed me over to this man. And I remember my, my mom, you know, telling me that uh, she's proud of me, she loved me. My grandma says, you know, you know, and all the stuff, the affection and stuff that, you know, that hoping this is the last time they'll see me, because that means I either made it, I'm freaking going to die, right? Wow. So, uh, but when you're 14, you're born, you think it's an adventure, so a lot of stuff has hit me yet. Uh, because I got caught twice right before, I'm like, all right, I'll probably see him tomorrow when, if I get caught again. So I follow this man, Dark. Um, we live in a city in Saigon, so we were like out of the, uh, you know, like the scene of Vietnam War with all the pad deals. So, uh, uh, he took me, drove for a little while to this kind of a uh, wait house. So I was joined up with another smaller group of like nine people. I was number 10. So we waited a little bit longer. I was the last one there. So then we trekked through nighttime to like rice paddy. Uh, and yeah. put, like mud up to my stomach because I'm only 14 and I was really short back then. I was probably like four feet tall or something, you know. So uh, I was the smallest one in the group. And um, we... Uh, we tracked through like probably like half an hour. We got to a small boat. We all got on, and that small boat took us to a bigger fishing boat. So back then, this is what happened. So uh, this river fishing boat, people would build a secret compartment underneath, and we would all be stole away underneath the secret compartment. And then the, this fishing boat would pretend they are fishing down the Mekong River in Vietnam until they get out to the ocean. Okay, so through this whole time. Usually people get caught because they go through checkpoint and coast guard. And you got, I was one of 153 people. Wow. So we were the last group to come and I was pretty much the last one to come down. I come down, it was dark down there. It was about 20 by 30 space, 20 feet by 30, 153 people. So we all clamped down there. It was dark, you know, and uh, we just sat there and I didn't realize this until people told me later, but it was three days we did this. Because the, the, the boats kind of fish slowly down the Mekong River, go through all this checkpoint. So, of course, the Coast Guard noticed people underneath because the freaking boat is sinking almost, right? Yeah. So, uh, pretty much people would bribe this Coast Guard to let us keep going, is what, what was happening. So, for three days, you know, tough water, people thrown up, pissing all over the place, you know, shitting, whatever you want to call it. It was <laughs> not cool. Yeah. But three days. Now, I was younger. But some people brought their kids, like a family kind of love. So they're younger kids at least. Every time we go to probably a, a checkpoint, we would hear the knock, knock on the, on the top of the boat. So we all know it's supposed to be quiet. Until a second knock comes around, when it's okay again. So during that time, everyone has to be quiet. Sometimes the kids get scared. They start crying, you know. And I, I can hear that the adults, like, muzzling them. And almost like, if they have to, they freaking would have to, you know, do whatever they have to do, make sure no one talks. So that went on for three days, which for me felt like an attorney. You know, three days in the dark, you just get a little water pass around. You know, people just anxious and stressed out. It was not great, okay? Wow. So we finally made it through the Coast Guard, just the farthest I've ever made on my last two trips I got caught. So what happened, the plan is, you just float until you get out the international water in the ocean. So you float until someone picks you up. That's the escape plan. So when we got out, all of a sudden, um, People say, okay, you can come on board now. And if you guys watch movie or read books and see picture of the, the boat people back then, I was one of those boat people, you see hundreds of people on top of a boat, right? That's what happened. We all then would come up on top of the boat because now it's safe for us to come up. So I was one of the last few that came up because uh, I was taught to be, you know, polite all the time. So I let all the older people, you know, that's respect to go up or the kids. I was like one of the last four or five that came up. So when I came up, that fresh air, I literally felt like I went from hell to heaven. You know what I mean? All mm. the smell I've had for three days. So I'm like all exciting, ecstatic. Like, yeah, man, this is awesome. And all of a sudden I felt like everyone's really quiet and somber. And all of a sudden I realized that the worst is not over yet because now we're in the vast ocean on this little river fishing boat. So here's what happened. The reason why only 50% of people make it, you know, you get caught or, or you, you don't make it, just this is in the early 80s, so the economy was, was really bad still. So a lot of surrounding country uh, uh, fishermen turned pirates. Yeah. Okay? Because money in Vietnam, just worth the papers printed on. So everyone converted to <clears throat> jewelry or gold to take with them. So these fishermen know, so they would then look for um, defenseless river fishing boats like ours that can't outmaneuver, can't outrun them. So they come on, 
uh, you know, Japanese, Chinese, Thai, whatever these fishermen, they come on, they take all the, the jewelry, they rape the women, and they sink the boat. That's mm-hmm. what happened. So luckily for us, we never ran across any of that. We had one day left of water, food, and gas, and we ran across a large ship, commercial ship just happened to be passing by. So you just float because you hope someone runs across you, right? So uh, that boat came across. So they called into the nearest refugee camp. So during this time, Red Cross set up refugee camps around countries around Vietnam. For the area we ended up in, Malaysia was the closest one. So they call in there. So I remember though, I was 14. So we found this big boat and everyone gets excited because we don't know how it works. It's our first time. We made it that far. I mean, that's our first time, right? So this boat hooked us up and then we're all excited thinking we'll get on this nice big boat. Of course, they don't let us on. Well, because they probably have protocol, right? They can't let us off. We might have disease. We might try to rob them or hijack. So they hooked us on. They threw down food, water, some warm clothes. So that was like for about a day because it took them that long to call in and the Red Cross to organize a boat to come out and get us. So about a day later, they came out, pulled us in. And when I got to the refugee camp, uh, they checked us in. So now I find out as soon as I get checked in later on, reading about it in history, of course, where I ended up was the island I was on was nicknamed Hell Island. Wow. At the time, it was said to be the most highly populated place on Earth. Hell I Island. I was one of 50,000 people in the size of a football field. Wow. Okay? So because I was only 14 by myself, I was considered an orphan. So uh, what you do is you declare what country you want to go to. And hopefully you have sponsors. So I have an aunt and uncle who live in, 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 in uh, you know, in the U.S. That's how I ended up in Minnesota. So they sponsor me because uh, I declared them, I named them. So because I was an orphan, only took me eight months to go. Now most people are there for like four to five to six years because they declare the country, and if they have family, they have to wait for a, a nonprofit or a church or somebody to sponsor them, right? So that's kind of the whole process. So I mean, I can even we have more time. I'll go into the whole story of leaving at eight months. It's not very pretty living condition, you know? So, but this is where I want to try to get to, is that night, my first night on that beach, it's crowded, but it's nighttime now, it's on the beach, so no one's like nearby me. And this is where I discovered, I realized later on now, that that's the time I discovered my choice theory, my why, okay? So, I remember sitting at that ocean that night and looking across the ocean, where I just all of a sudden it hit me that everyone I knew, everything about me, my life, my friends, my family on the other side of the ocean. Wow. Okay. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm thinking, am I lucky or am I unlucky? Mm-hmm. Am I lucky that I made it? Or am I unlucky that my mom kind of set me off? Right? So I don't know how long it was, but I know I cry all night. I was 14. It falls and realize it hit me. Now, Asian man, firstborn, typically you're not supposed to cry at all. That's probably the first time and the last time I cried forever. But I don't know how long I cried, but I remember thinking about shit, man, thinking through it all. Like, am I lucky? Am I unlucky? A lot of stuff went back and forth. And I finally made a choice. And this is when I think I discovered a choice theory because life is all about choices. So I chose that I was lucky. I could have chose I was unlucky and it was like the victim mentality probably from then on. I chose that I was lucky. I was lucky I made it. And I have the responsibility now to go take care of myself, take care of my family back in Vietnam. That's counting on me. So I remember kind of telling myself in Vietnamese, so to speak, like put on your big boy pants and, and, and then I'll get on with it. <clears throat> but wow. this is also where I found my why. Okay? So nowadays when I share a lot of my story, I usually tell people that because of what I went through, I'm passionate about helping people and I'm passionate about paying it forward because I came from nothing. And where I'm at right now, yeah, I work hard for it, but I'm very lucky to be at. And along the way, I meet many people that have a part of my journey. Big, how a big or small, you may not realize, just like you, Kevin, you've been a part of my journey, man. You know, so you may not realize where, where I'm at. That's why anytime anyone wants to, I will do whatever I can to pay forward to help out. It's amazing. So on, on that beach is when I figure out my why. So I ask people a lot about their why. They'll say, um, because I want to take care of my family, because of this, what happened, what happened. But when you figure out your why, your life will change. Not just uh, uh, personally, but uh, you know, but professionally. So your why is usually an event or a series of events in your life. And most of the time when you're younger, something happened to you when you're younger. 
And for me, it was when I was on that beach. My why is this. I remember the feeling I had on that night on that beach, and I never want anyone to have the same feeling I had. Mm. I don't ever want people to know, why can't I be with my family, my loved one? Why can't I help? I feel helpless at the time, right? I made it now. Now what can I do for them? So that's my why. So I never want anyone to feel what I felt on that beach. So I now I do whatever I can to help anyone out to, to, to better their life. So uh, shortly, quickly, to move on. So then uh, eight months later, I got lucky. Here's how it works at the, that island. Every morning, they call out the name of the people who gets the leave the island. Mm. This is like shit you see in movie, right? Yeah. It's like with the lottery. So at that time, the end come, comes down to the island. And they call your name, and you got like half an hour to get through the, the port so that the ship's going to go to, um, you know, to the uh, 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 Kuala Lumpur, which is the, 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 the capital, so they can fly us out. So my name was called. Okay? Now, at this point, I remember feeling very excited. I remember feeling really guilty. Mm. Because, again, I made a choice that I'm lucky instead of unlucky, right? So I'm like, I know I've had friends. I've been there for four or five years. And I've only been there eight months. And I get to leave. And I remember coming to this one person who's an adult that I kind of lean on like my parents that had no parents there. I remember asking him. I said, hey, my name just got called. And I, I remember telling him about uh, this other kid, a friend of mine, that became my best friend when I was there. He pretty much took care of me. He knew the role because he's been there for like five years. So you know what? He's been in five years. Can I just give him my spot to go? Wow. I remember him, this adult male said, you are so freaking stupid. You said it again, I'm going to slap you. You do not want anyone to hear about it because this is your chance to go. You never want to give that up. And I didn't realize that, you know, and I'm like, okay, I probably was stupid. And uh, so, you know, he was the one, he and his wife gave me this bag, like a carry-on bag, gave me a set of clothes because they had a son about my size. So I came to America with a shirt and a pair of shorts and a bag, you know? Wow. So, uh, I got here uh, to America, and now I live with my aunt and uncle. But when I uh, when I got here, my dad is now considered a Nelson Mandela of Vietnam. Okay? Mm. You guys Google him at all. His first name is Quat. H O A T. Write that down. That's me. B O A T. So uh, he's got the Wikipedia pages and all kind of links, uh, you know, about him. So, anyways, the organization out in the U.S. and around the world uh, found out I made it here. So uh, uh, my dad is not considered a man, Nelson Mandela, but not pretty much. So they contacted me, got a hold of my uncle, and they kind of made me the poster child. So at the age of 16 to about 24, they would fly me all around the country to speak on my dad's behalf. But my dad was writing articles about human rights and democracy, they get smuggled out. So he would, uh, they would move my dad from Saigon, where we live, all the way to by the border of Laos. So when I was there, we used to get to go visit him like once a month. If he behaved, right? So prison in Vietnam is nothing like there, man. Here people get to eat three meals a day, one <laughs> table to be worked out, maybe get a PhD if you want to run a business out of prison if you want to. I hear some story, right? There's nothing like that. The family support the prisoner because all they give you is rice, enough to live on, and water. <clears throat> so we will bring food to last for a whole month until we come back. But my dad is so nice, he wants to take out other people. He ends up feeding people who don't have family to do that. He said, we used to bring extra money so he can help buy food for them. So before I left, from the age of 8 to 14, he already been moving further and further away. In the last trip I went to see him, it took us three days to get there because it's not like in the U.S. you jump in a car and you drive down the road, right? You would go maybe a day by, you know, bicycle, half a day by ox cart, hike another half a day get to another spot to get to it so and you're hauling stuff to come to give to them wow so it wasn't easy but anyways um so people found out who i was so then i became the poster child uh for human rights because uh, uh they would fly me out talk to congressman senator i accepted four or five award on his behalf the kennedy human rights award all kind of stuff i remember i sat with the kennedy at the table accepting award and dinner with wow. the kennedy it's, it's, you know it's kind of neat to look back now uh, but I had to learn from the age of 16 to start doing public speaking, which I was deathly afraid of, of course. I had to write all my own speeches. Um, so anyways, I did it till I was 24. Because two years later when I made it, my younger brother made the same trip, and he luckily made it too. So he came and lived with us with my aunt and uncle in Minnesota. And when I reached the age of 18, it was my time to move out. So I moved out 
he came with me. It was eighth grade. I, I raised him until he was out of high school, and I put myself in college. I worked like three jobs or whatever. So, uh, um, but during that time, I would fly to these places and do stuff in between my job and school. So at the age of 24, I finally sponsored my mom and my youngest brother over. Because at the time, now we have this program. You can sponsor your family member over. So when my mom came over when I was 24, she took over and started campaigning for my dad. So 32 was when I got to see my dad. They wow. finally agreed to release my dad, but with one condition. He had, can only be exiled out because he's got so big that if he was in Vietnam and released, there'd be like a revolution happen, right? So of course, the last four years in prison, my dad was in isolation. So he didn't even know what's going on in the world because they isolated him on purpose so that he can't keep writing about stuff. So once a year, the Red Cross gets to go back and visit my dad because all of my work to bring awareness on him is on the top list, right? So every time the U.S. talked to the Vietnamese back then, there was economic embargo, all kind of stuff. My dad named all this house, how quarter. So my mom gets to come back with the Red Cross to convince my dad to leave. So this is in the early 90s now. So she told him, get out. You can still work. You're not abandoning the people. There's this thing called internet now. <laughs> you know, all of us now take all this stuff for granted, you know. Now, this is a, a PhD guy who six, six, six languages, but he's been isolated so long. There's some cool story he tells me that when he gets out, he's in a hotel and the uh, air conditioner was so cold, he caught a cold because he couldn't figure out to turn it down. The tea was so loud, he's looking for the dial, but it's remote control. They get food to eat and this thing called microwave, even though it existed. <laughs> wow. you know, all these little things we take for granted. So fast forward, the age of 32 is when I finally got there to, to see him because he came over. Um, but that's quickly in my story. So what's the question you have? That's, that's, a, that's just an amazing story. Like today, what I was thinking about doing was, uh, talking about tracking, <laughs> how to track, how to track your clients, how to follow up. And then we were talking last night and like, I was like, Oh my God, we need to talk to long about this. We need to get this out and tell people about this story because it's so amazing. And you think about, you know, we go through these challenges every day and I'm like, you know, I've called. 50 people today and nobody's answered my my call and i'm like bummed out for like a four, like four hours because of it right like i'm it ruins my day but then you think about people like yourself who have overcome all these like unreal unbelievable challenges it just puts everything into perspective um and that's just an amazing story and thank you so much for for sharing it yeah i, I just wanted to ask you um so when you got into real estate like how how did that all happen? Um, we're, yep. We're so, uh, yep, I was finishing up school at the University of Minnesota. And in the spring, you know, when I was, I mean, it took me six years. I worked three jobs. I was raising my brother, right? So they have these job fair usually in the spring for the college kid. So I went out and interviewed. Um, and then uh, I got a job. I started out uh, as a mortgage a loan trainee uh, to about 26 years ago. So uh, this is my 26 year in the business, my first 15 years on the mortgage side, my last 11 years in real estate. How did you? So that's kind of how I got the industry. How did you? How did you grow? Because now you have a company, you have a large, very yeah. successful company. Can yeah. you just? So we, you talk about it a little bit. And I'll, I'll refer back to what you said. Do you know how you make this 50 calls and no one pick up the phone, call you back? You feel like bum. It's all about the choices, right? That you make. You can see that as a bad thing or a positive thing. One thing about in our culture, I learned. I say ours now because I'm American. In our culture, we celebrate success but we don't celebrate failure now the reason i think where i'm at because i fail so many times with the shit i go through that made me who i am today so instead of thinking that it's going yes i had 50 no's not that close to the next yes right and that's how you have to think which lead back to tracking that you talked about kevin same thing man history that's what we all want to learn about history right want to know what happened how to prevent that or how to learn to repeat it if it's good but well, tracking is similar to that if you don't track what you do how do you know how well you're doing and how well you're not doing? Where can you improve? Where can you not, you know, what you spend more time on? So I think at the end of the day, for me, uh, besides all that stuff I shared with you and what I went through, is that uh, all of us, I will never wish what I went through on anybody, but it may be who I am, okay? So I want everyone to know that don't be afraid to try things and get out of your comfort zone. Because when you fail, you actually learn. So uh, my business partner, Mike, and I, you know Mike, we're here. Yeah. So we, we come up with an acronym we call LIFE. LIFE is, you know, what's LIFE all about? LIFE. L stands for learn. I stands for implement. F stands for fail. E stands for evaluate. You learn. You try it. If you fail, you, 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 you evaluate. You, you learn again. So what happened then is I failed so many times. <laughs> that, uh, that's the way I'm at today. But what I've learned through all my failures in our business, 
mortgage, real estate, insurance, financial advice, whatever. We're in the people business. Right. And I believe because I'm successful because my network is my network. The more people we know, the richer we'll be. So my whole 26 years has been about building relationships. So my business and is a relationship and not transactional. So we're talking very, very broadly right now, but how do you build relationships? What are, get some details. What are some ways yeah. to do that? So uh, <laughs> when I was producing, now I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm running a company now, so I do less. But when I was producing, my goal was to meet two people and they face to face. So wow. that, with the technology grow now, they will get way more efficient on contacting people or tracking. But sometimes it takes us away from that face to face. And that's one thing that we can never replace with technology, except compromise like like this right now, Zoom, right? right? But it's still, you can see that person. There's that face-to-face communication, you read the nonverbal, you know, the phone and all stuff, but you can't feel on the phone or by the text. So I would do two because, go ahead. No, no, I was gonna, go, go. Because, because uh, I don't care who I meet, because on an average, everyone knows, even if you're not very well connected, an average of 200 other people. If I meet two people a day, I potentially have access to 400 people. So the person I met might not be ready to buy or sell a home today until two or three years from now, but now they have a cousin, a friend, a parent who wanted to buy or sell a home. So uh, my, what I secret I found out too is because I truly want to know people and help people. In my meeting, I never talk real estate. Okay, I was just going to ask you about that. What do you? What do you? That, uh, you might have heard called uh, the seven levels of communication. 7L, right? Yeah. Seven levels of communication. So in that book, it talks about the pyramid. So the bottom is like your advertising, you know, your electronic email text, your your thank you note, your seminar. On the very top of the pyramid, level seven, is face-to-face. And mm-hmm. that's what I learned. So face-to-face, your conversion ratio will be higher than any text or email or call. When you get the face-to-face in that same book, it has an acronym called FROG. Now, some other people have a different called Ford, but FROG stands for family, recreation, occupation, goal. If you go by four, the B is dream. So when I meet people, I, I talk about family first. Hey, where do you grow up? You know, you talk about your wife, your family. If you remember when we meet, and I usually find out about your family, your kid. You, I do it now naturally without realizing it. Yeah. So I get to talk about them, ask them, and then a lot of times they'll ask about me, and I'll share my story, my family. And then if we have time, I go to occupation. What do you do? How can I help you? You know, how do I get to then Guess what? They usually will ask you back about your occupation, right? Yeah. And that's the time I, I have what I call an elevator speech. I have my 30 seconds to two minutes. I talk about what I do. Mm-hmm. You know, I love helping people buy, sell, hope the market's awesome right now. If you're thinking about it, you know somebody, let me know. And then I stop there. I move to another topic. Mm. I don't want the meeting to be about real estate where people don't want to meet me because they think I'm selling them something. So... That's really, really good. And used used frog, family, recreation, occupation, goal. And we're almost out of time. But what you're basically saying is when you're meeting those two people a day, you're talking with them about, you're basically natural, having a natural conversation. You're talking about family, F. You're talking about recreation. You're talking about occupation. And then you're talking about your goal, which is, hey, do you know anyone or whatever? You just, you kind of interject that in the conversation and That's then right. you continue, right? That's right. So if they're serious about, and then we'll wrap up quick, if they're serious about real estate now, they know somebody, that's when my next meeting I schedule will be about business. Got it. I think people forget, they come in, they want to get that transaction, they get out, then they smell the commission breath a mile away. Right. Okay? So I want to come in with the mentality, I'm here to help you, i like to know about you, but I can't help you until I know more about you. Oh, now I know you got a kid, and we have a, if I help buy your house, it'll be a four bedroom, three bathroom, maybe a large yard, if you have a dog. These are the things that I get from this conversation naturally without doing more like a questionnaire now you know what you're looking for for your parameters right if you were to if you were to give us uh like one bit of advice in terms of how to reach out to our people what's i mean there's like facebook there's phone there's email like within our sphere what's what would you say is the first step somebody should take to yeah, reach out so to i have i have two apps i use besides doing a blast email i use slide dial slide dial and, use, and that's use uh, text to group so you text to a group, you can text to your 500 people in your database, and I do this usually in the holiday. Like uh, this last one, Christmas, right? New Year. Hey, this is long, so when I say Happy New Year, so I text that out to 500 people, they all get it, but look at what came from me, so they reach back to me directly. Or a slide out, when you call 500 people in your database, it doesn't ring, it goes right straight to your voicemail. So right. I say, 
and I do it generic. Hey, this is Blonde. Just want to, you know, wish you a Merry Christmas. And then that's it. So I don't ask for any business. Usually I get an engagement back at 10%. There's only about up to 50 people who either call me back and say, I, I didn't hear the phone ring. You want to write the <laughs> voicemail? Or those tech men said, Hey, Long, good to hear from you. Great. Oh, by the way, my sister was thinking about buying a house. So can I send it to you? That's awesome. What was the Do first one you said? Me. Tech. So slide down. What was the text one? Text to group. Text to group. Yep, awesome. It's an app. Perfect. So those are things I do, and then uh, and then from there, your whole goal is like I'm being an ISA to myself. My whole goal is to reach people and set appointments. Love it. Long, we're out of time, man. We could we could go on for hours and hours and hours and yeah, hours. I'd love to be back if you want me to. I'd lo love to have you back. Really, really appreciate you sharing your amazing, beautiful story with us, and uh, yeah, and it's just it's just uh, so inspiring. And thank you so much. Congratulations on all of your success. We didn't even get into you being one of the top. 1% of agents in the country for almost 25 years. You're killing it. Uh, well, we'll definitely do another one, man. So thank you so much. All right. Well, uh, happy birthday. You're twin boy tomorrow and have a good party. Thanks a lot. All right. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Yep.